Hi, this is a six part tutorial series to teach you how to make your first platformer game in GameMaker. The purpose of this tutorial is to teach you uh, what you can do with relatively simple code in this powerful piece of software. And in the last video, we covered the basic mechanics of a platformer game, uh, momentum based movement, jumping, variable jumping, uh, player character animations, and uh, just good movement mechanics and jumping mechanics. Oop, bumped my mic. Uh, and in this video, we're going to create enemies and hazards and a very simple combat system and a checkpoint system, which should be fun. So let's go. Before we do anything else, let's clean up and organize the player objects step event, because if you recall from last video, it's getting a little complex and a little messy, and we want to keep everything clean. Now, one thing that you should always be doing is proper indentation. Whenever you're within a set of curly brackets, everything should be flush left one indent, and then everything within the next set of curly brackets should be indented once. You should just be doing this and your code will become instantly unreadable if you're not doing proper indenting. But another thing we can do is set code regions. So we're going to create regions for this code that allows us to minimize and maximize sections of code. So here under get inputs, I'm going to add a new line and write the pound sign or hashtag sign, whatever you want to call it, and then region and call it player inputs. And then I'm going to have an open line after that and then an open line and then pound sign end region. Now, if you wait a second, game maker should recognize that and you should see a little minimize button. You can click that and just close, minimize this code. And when you want to reach this code, you maximize it and open it up. But our goal is to put everything in this step event within its own region. The next region, I'm going to go down two lines, region calculate movement. And then I'm going to go down here to right before collisions and write end region and then go up here and minimize it. Next should be collisions, return two lines, region, collisions. And then down here, end region. Oh, one word. Wait for this. There we go. Another region. Region current status. And it's just going to be this small section of code, but we'll add more to it later. And region. Close that. New region. Animations. And region. Wait for this. There we go. And then here, a last region called game control. And region. And now everything is nice and clean and we want to ac access a section. We open it up, we make our adjustments and then we close it and it can stay clean and organized. So now we can add wall jumping and wall sliding, which should be really fun mechanically in our platformer game. So first thing we have to do, step one for doing this is we need to check if the, if the character is on the wall. So go to the current status section, open that up and underneath uh, where we check if it's on the ground, we will write comment check to see if on or next to wall. On wall equals place meeting x plus one. Oh, y, o block minus place meeting x minus one y, o block. So this works similarly to our dir variable where it takes two different values and checks to see if they're true or returns one or zero and then it subtracts it. So if we are, if we have a wall to our right, this will be one and this will be zero. So it will return one. If we are next, if there's a wall to our left, this will be zero and then this will return one. And since we have this negative here, it will return negative one. And if we have a wall on each side of us perfectly, it will return zero. Now we shouldn't design our game so that there's two walls perfectly on each side of the player. So that shouldn't be an issue. So now we should go to our create event and add a section called wall. I'm gonna put it after jumping. 
and declare the variable on wall equals zero. So now we have a variable to check if we're next to a wall. I'm going to close that section. Uh, the next step for wall jumping is we need to add a new sprite for when the character is on the wall and a new sprite that will look like the character's... Uh, actually, sorry. Uh, forget that what I just said. We're only going to be adding a new sprite for when the character's on the wall. In a previous version of this tutorial, I had dust uh, get kicked up, but I removed that for simplicity. So we're only going to add a new sprite uh, for when the character is on the wall, we're going to create a new sprite, create sprite, and call it S player wall, and import the appropriate image, which should be right here, S player wall, and it's only one image. Open that up and set the sprite's origin to middle center. And we can set the FPS to zero if you like, but it shouldn't matter because our animation section will be adjusting that. Now go back to the step event under animations in the animations region. And we want our new wall slide sprite to override the sprite when we're in the air. So if we're in the air but on a wall, we want the wall sprite, not the air sprite. So net uh, navigate to the not on ground section. So and in the this if in this condition statement for when we're not on the ground, we're going to move these three lines of code and we're going to write uh, some new lines of code. So in this section, we're going to write a new if condition if on wall does not equal zero, meaning that we are on a wall. Open parentheses, close parentheses. I had a comment if on the wall and off the ground. And then else, open curly bracket, and then this is where we're going to put these three lines. So I'm going to go at the end of these lines and put the close curly bracket, highlight all of them, and then indent them in. So they're appropriately indented. And that should be right now. So now here in this if statement, we are going to write some code indent sprite index equals s player wall, of course, image x scale equals on the wall, because this variable on wall checks to see if there's a wall to our left or our right. And if it's on our right, it is one. And if it's on our left, it is negative one. That is a great way to just assign that to our x scale, and it will flip it horizontally uh, appropriately, which is very convenient to us. And then I'm just going to add a comment that says on left wall, negative one, on right wall, one. Now we can check to see if it works. Now we don't have wall sliding just yet, but at least our sprite should be appropriate. Yep, when we're on a wall, it is, and if we're on the wall and off the ground, it turns to our wall slide animation. So it looks like our character is gripping onto the wall. So now we can get started on our wall slide and also wall jump. So in the create event, declare a, a variable for wall gravity. So in the wall section, we will write grav underscore wall because we want to fall a little slower when we're on the wall. So it looks like we're sliding down. All right. Equals 0 0.1 semicolon. Gravity is reduced when sliding down a wall. And then we're going to add some variables for wall jumps. So underneath that, I will write HSP, um, bleh, HSP underscore W jump equals six. Comment max HSP for moving away from a wall during wall jump. Jump speed underscore wall equals negative nine, semicolon, comment how high you jump during wall jump, which we want to be smaller than our regular jump because we want most of our movement to go left or right, not up, but we'll go up a little bit. And then max VSP wall equals five, max falling speed when sliding. Now go to the step event and go to, I'm going to close the animations region, and go to the calculate movement region, 
and locate calculate horizontal movement section and then create a new section underneath all of this we want this before the calculate vertical movement section so here we find calculate vertical movement right before that is where we're going to add a section called wall jump if on wall does not equal zero oh and not on ground and key jump so here's our comment oh open curly brackets close curly brackets I always add those right away i'm going to add a comment here on wall and in the air and jump key pressed new comment within this condition statement but indented change ah. HSP to be opposite the wall, jump away from wall. HSP equals negative on wall times HSP underscore W jump. New comment, change VSP to jump vertically differently than from the ground. VSP equals jump speed wall semicolon and uh at the first line of the calculate vertical movement section replace vsp grav with the following code so i'm just going to delete this and write a new set of code i'm going to call this it's called comment gravity local variable so var grav final equals grav this imports grav from the create event var vsp max final equals max vsp semicolon import max vsp from create event and then if on wall does not equal zero and vsp is greater than zero open curly bracket, close curly bracket, but add a comment here. If sliding down on wall, indent, grav final equals grav wall, semicolon, slide slower than in the air, and VSP max final equals max VSP wall, semicolon, Comment slide slower than in the air. And then underneath that, write VSP plus equals grab final. VSP equals clamp. Oh, we're going to add our clamp, our clamp code, which is down here. We need to move it up to gravity. Which makes me think I need to move this gravity section to after our ground jump, but hold on a second. Let me finish this first. VSP clamp VSP, and then we need to change the rest of this code to be minus VSP max final, comma VSP max final. There we go. So we moved that clamp. I think it should work just fine going there, even though we had adjust the VSP afterwards. But we can test it out. So let's test it out, see if it works. If it works, I don't need to move that. All right, so wall slide. Yep, we do. And when I hit the jump key away from the wall, I do jump a little bit. from the wall. So if you run the game and you can, uh, you, you might see a problem here, which is we can kind of perpetually stay on the wall by like holding the key in the direction of the wall and then just perpetually hitting 
the jump key, we can actually go upwards, perpetually like wall climb that way. Now that might be fine if that's what you want for your game, but I don't want this for the game I'm making here. So we're gonna add some code to fix that. So I will uh, go to the create event and declare a variable under wall. Write a new comment here. Player loses control for 20 frames after wall jump. Wall jump delay equals zero. Wall jump delay max equals 20. Now go to the step event. I'm gonna, under calculate movement, we're gonna find our calculate horizontal movement section and make this the first line of that section. Comment will reduce wall jump delay by one every frame until we hit zero. Wall jump delay equals max. Wall jump delay minus one, comma, zero, close parentheses, semicolon. And next, wrap the entire contents of the, the calculate horizontal movement section after the, this first line in the curly brackets of an if statement. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to write uh, if wall jump delay double equal sign zero, open curly bracket, and then I'm going to go down here until we get to the vertical movement section and I'm going to add a closing curly bracket. Then I'm going to highlight everything here and within those two curly brackets and I'm going to hit indent. So everything here from uh, ending at the calculate vertical movement section to where we just wrote that if statement, all that gets highlighted and indented in. And I'm going to add a little comment after this if condition statement that says won't be able to move left or right until this equals zero. And in the first line of the wall jump if statement here, we're going to write wall jump delay equals wall jump delay underscore max semicolon comment just wall jumped so no horizontal movement. Now we should check to see if this all works. And it should. We'll see. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to hold right. I'm going to hold it so I'm going the direction of the wall and I'm going to perpetually hit the Oh, look at that. Hit And because we wrapped that entire section in the curly brackets of that if condition statement, we're actually wall jumping much further away, which is nice. Because our deceleration doesn't kick in for those 20 frames that we are jumping away from a wall. And that's going to look good when we put two walls next to each other. Uh, and you can adjust the wall jump delay max variable here, change it from 20 frames, change it to 15, change it to 25. Find, find an amount of frames that works good for you. But what's cool about this, if I go to instances layer of R level one, if I go here and I paint some blocks here, we can actually do some cool wall jumping. Which is kind of fun. Now let's add some enemies and hazards. So all platform games have hazards of some kind. That's what make it a, makes it a platform game. Don't fall off the platform and fall into a hazard and die. Uh, others have enemies. If you touch an enemy, your character dies and it's game over. So we're going to add all that functionality here. So to do that, you need to understand parent and children objects first. So you can create objects in GameMaker that are parent objects. And if a parent object has some attribute, then all of its children objects will have those same attributes. So we're going to create an object object and call it O bad. And O bad is going to be a parent object over both our enemies and our hazards. Now create another object and call it uh, 
let's see, oh, hazard, and set its parent, which is right here, set its parent to be oh, bad. Then create another object, call it oh, enemy, set its parent object to be oh, bad. Then create a sprite, call it S hazard, and import the appropriate images for it, which are here, hazard 0 to hazard 15. So there should be 16 total. Change its frames per second to 20. And set its origin, make sure its origin is top left, just like our blocks. Now if you run, you should see the little animation of the spikes moving create another sprite, call it S enemy, import our enemy. There's only one image, S enemy. And uh, set its origin to be middle center. And then go to our objects and uh, set the appropriate sprites. So O hazard, set its sprite to be S hazard, and then O enemy, set its sprite to be s enemy. Now let's web now let's make it so when the player touches either of these objects the game restarts. We do this by targeting the code to our bad object o bad and since the hazard object and the enemy object are both children of o bad, they are both considered part of the o bad family, so the code will apply to them too. So we're going to open up our player object at the step event. I'm going to minimize this region so it not looks nice and clean. And uh, under, let's say, near the end of our step events, let's say under animations, create a region called enemies. End region. And we can write game over if place meeting x, y, o, bad. Open code. Oh two close, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, indent, game, restart, open and close parentheses, semicolon. Now open up our level one room and create a new instances layer by clicking this and you'll see instances one appear and we're going to rename that by right clicking and clicking rename layer or just hitting F2 and rename it bad and we're going to put it, we're going to click and drag it to underneath our instances layer. Now click the layer to make sure that it's highlighted and selected. Always be aware which layer that you're adding instances of objects to. And in that layer, drag some hazards and enemies to test it out. So our bad layer is selected. I'm gonna click O hazard, hold the Alt key. And let's add some hazards like right here. Then under instances, I'm going to add some more blocks here. And then back to our bad layer, let's add an enemy right there so we can test it out. Run the game, and when we touch any of these objects, our game should restart. Yep. And if I touch this enemy, our game restarts. Beautiful. Now to make it seem more natural, we're going to set the collision mask for these enemy sprites to be a little bit less uh, so that you can actually see the, see the player touching it a little bit better. So go to collision mask. It's just too much. Go to collision mask, change the mode to manual, and you can see these uh, black squares that turn white. They highlight. Let's just drag it in like one, two, three. Ah, right there. Yeah, let's just do it to like the skull, huh? Except the bottom, I want it to be all the way to the bottom of the sprite still. And then for hazard, collision mask, manual, uh, I want it to be like down here. So you really have to touch the spikes to die. A little lower, maybe. There we go. So this makes it more natural. So oftentimes if you have collision masks at the very edges of sprites, you don't even get to see uh, a character touching them. And so it feels unnatural. It's like, hey, I didn't even touch it. But if you set it to be less, it seems more natural. So our 
uh, hazards we've already animated, uh, but and they're not going to move. But our, our enemies, we do want to move back and forth like they're patrolling an area. And we can add more complicated behavior if we want, and you can feel free to add more complicated behavior. But for now, this meets the basic expectations of a platformer game. So first, let's add a couple of enemies in. So we have our enemy here. Highlight the, the bad layer. Click O enemy. And I'm going to add an enemy. Uh, let's see. Add an enemy here. Instances block. I'll add another block here. Click here. Let's add an enemy up there. There we go. And then back to instances. So we kind of have to like wall jump up there to test it. This little enemy should be patrolling back and forth over there. And then our hazards are there. All right, so let's uh, add some attributes that the player object has, like gravity and collision checks, to the enemy object. So you're going to do some copying and pasting here. Close that room window. And in our O enemy uh, object, add a step event. And then write the following code. HSP, oh, new comment, calculate horizontal movement. HSP equals current dir times HSP max. Calculate vertical movement. VSP plus equals grav. VSP equals clamp. VS, oh, VSP comma negative VSP max comma VSP max. Close parentheses semicolon. Now we're going to copy the entire collisions region from the player object and paste it into the step event of the enemy object. So open O player, go to step, let's close this region, open collisions, and we're going to copy all of this. And we're going to move it over to our enemy object. Close our player object, make this a little bit bigger. And we're going to add a create event with all of the appropriate variables that you've now used in the step event. Add event, create, HSP equals zero, VSP equals zero, HSP, HSP max equals two, VSP max equals 10, current dir equals one, grav equals 0 0.4. I think that's all the variables. Now run the game and see if it works. So our uh, enemy objects are moving to the right, and then they reached a block and they stopped. Uh, but we can make the enemies change directions every time they hit a wall uh, so that they look like they're patrolling. And we all we have to do is add this one line of code to the horizontal collision check section after we set its HSP to equal zero. So right after that, we will write current dir times equals negative one, which will mean it changes directions. So right now, current dir is set to one, means move right. Uh, but after we hit a wall, it will multiply it by negative one, which will change it to negative one, and once it hits a wall to the left, negative one times negative one will change it to positive one again, and it will change back and forth. Run the game, see if it works. And our little patrolling bad guys. Now let's add some checkpoints. So before we uh, make like the game over or death more dynamic and interesting, instead of just restarting the game, we need to add checkpoints. So. Uh, that way, when a player touches an enemy or a hazard, we will, instead of restarting the game, we will return to a checkpoint. So first, let's create the checkpoint sprite in object, create a new sprite, call it S checkpoint. 
import the appropriate sprite, which should look like zero and one. So both these image zero and one, highlight them both and open them. FPS equals zero, origin, middle, center. And then we're going to create a new object. Call it O checkpoint. Set the appropriate sprite. And before we add code here, let's add a splash room where we can declare our global variables. As you know from my previous tutorial, we should always declare global variables before anything else happens in our game so that the, the global variables are already created. To do that, we are going to create a new room. Where is room? There we are. Call it our splash. Hover your mouse right before that room and you should see like a little up and down arrow click that to reorder the room so our splash comes before our level one so if you click and drag it up you'll see a little home icon now appear before our splash close that out that makes it so our splash room appears first in game maker and we can declare its global variables and then move to our level one we're going to set its width and height to be the same size because that sets the window size of our game. So the very first room should be the same, the size of our window room, uh, size of our window or desired window. Then we can uh, click creation code and write global dot checkpoint room equals no one. Global dot checkpoint X equals zero. Global dot checkpoint Y equals zero global dot checkpoint id equals no one room go to our level one and this will take us to level one so close out of that hit center fit back to our splash close out a splash now go back to o checkpoint and in a step event let's write some stuff if global dot checkpoint id equals id meaning the id of this particular instance wherever it's placed in the room open curly brackets close curly brackets image index equals one else open curly brackets close curly brackets image index equals zero so this will switch between the two images now go to our level one and change the name of our instances layer, change it to player. This is going to be our player layer. And then uh, we're going to add a few checkpoint objects to a new layer called checkpoints. So here, click new instance layer and automatically appears on the top, which is nice and rename it to checkpoints on top of the player layer. And we're going to add some uh, some checkpoints in here so we can test this out. I'll add a checkpoint here. I'll add a checkpoint here. I'll add a checkpoint here. Let's actually raise them up a little bit. Close out of that. In the checkpoint object, in the step event, in the else statement here below image index equals zero, write if place meeting x, y, o player, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, global dot check point room equals room, meaning whatever room we're in, global dot check point x equals x, the, the X location of this checkpoint. Global dot checkpoint y equals y, meaning the y position of this checkpoint. And then global dot checkpoint id equals id, the id of this instance of our checkpoint. So if it becomes the active checkpoint, it sets all these global variables. And then since it changes the checkpoint id to the id of this particular instance, wherever it's placed in the room, it will now change the image index to the next image. So check to see if it works. Whenever we touch a checkpoint, it should change to the number one, meaning it's the active checkpoint. And the other ones should turn to zero. Very good. 
So now we'll make it so the player goes to the last checkpoint if they touch an enemy or a hazard. So close out of this. In the R level one creation code, write the following line. If bang instance exists. So if this instance doesn't exist of an o, of O player, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. Instance, let me make this a little bigger. Instance create layer global dot checkpoint dot uh global dot checkpoint x comma global dot checkpoint y comma the player layer comma o player close parentheses semicolon so this is going to make it so every time a room loads and we're going to add this to every new level that we create uh, it'll check to see if a player object exists, and if it doesn't, it will create a player object and place it where it should be, which is the last active checkpoint. But this also means, if you close out of this and hit center fit here, it also means that we can't have this uh, player object already loaded in our room. So click the player layer and click the player object and delete it. This won't work if the player object is already in the room. We want our room to create the player object wherever we need to create it. Uh, so we also need to change our global, uh, checkpoints, our global checkpoint variables to be level one and the appropriate location in the room. So when the game first loads up, it knows where to put the player. So let's find a good location for the player. I'm going to select the player layer here, and I'm just going to move my mouse around. And if you'll notice down here, it gives you the X and Y coordinates in the room, and we're going to find a good coordinate for our player. So we want our player to be created like here, four, four, five, four, four, five. Let's just say that four, four, five, four, four, five. I will open splash creation code and change checkpoint X to four, four, five, Y four, four, five. And you're going to have to find your own values of where you want to create the player and checkpoint room. We're going to change it to our level one and checkpoint ID is just going to be no one for now. And we will open the room and our player object gets created and it gets created more or less where we want to create it now it gets created in the air a little bit so i can actually open our splash and make this number a little bigger so i can make it instead of 445 make it like 460. maybe it makes the player a little lower it does let's make it 465. i just don't want to don't want it so it looks like the player is falling 470 still falling let's try 480. also don't want to spawn the player in the block Ooh, that's getting close 483. that's perfect so we're spawning right at the ground i guess i i can just hit enter to quick restart our game i am falling one pixel it appears you can't see it in the video but i can see it so 484 I'm still falling one pixel. All right, four, eight, five. I'm sure this is super interesting to you. Beautiful. So that's spawning the player right on the ground so the player is no longer falling. So let's stop here and let's polish some things. We need to make it so that when the player touches an enemy or hazard, the player starts at the most recent checkpoint. And to do this, all we have to do is change the game over code in the player step event. So let's close out of splash, close out of our level one, open O player step event. Let's close out of collisions where it goes to uh, enemies. So uh, we need to change the game over code here, but since we're going to be doing a lot of changes, let's just change this code instead of O player bad, remove game restart and just write death, open and close parentheses, semicolon, because we're going to write a script called death. And whenever we touch something bad, it'll just run the script. Now we haven't created the script yet, so it's going to create a little caution here, but we are about to create a new script. So go to scripts, right click, go to create and create a new script and call it death. And if you rename it first, you got to make sure that here in the asset label uh, library, it's called death. And also here where it says function, uh, it's called death here, open and close parentheses. Now within this function, we can write if 
global dot checkpoint ID equals no one. I guess it should be double equal sign here, huh? Open curly brackets, close curly brackets, room restart, open and close parentheses semicolon, else open curly brackets, close curly brackets, room go to global dot checkpoint room. So this checks to see if we have touched a checkpoint yet. If we haven't, it just restarts our first room because after that we imagine the player will have touched a checkpoint. And if we have touched a checkpoint, it's going to go to the right room when we die. And when we die and we go back to the correct room, it will spawn our player in the right location. So let's check to see if it works. So I'm going to touch the checkpoint and touch the hazard. And yep, I get spawned at the correct checkpoint. Very good. Since we just did a script to universalize something, let's do that to the room creation code. So every time that we make a new room, because this game is going to have several different rooms or levels, we can just write the function room code and everything will be there. So let's open our level one in the creation code. And here I'm going to just highlight everything and hit control X or command X to just cut it out, but it's now copied for us. And I'm going to write room code, open and close parentheses, semicolon. And we are going to create a new function that is called room code. So over scripts, highlight, create script, call it room code. And then here in room code, I'm going to hit control V or command V and paste this in there. Bam. Also indent it. And now we have one central place to add all of our new creation code for our rooms whenever we need to. Close out of that. Now, finally, let's uh, give some text so the player knows that this is a checkpoint whenever it touches a checkpoint. Let's close out of these. Keep your workspace clean. we got to create a new font. So over fonts, right-click, create font. I'm going to call it uh, FNT default. Or I guess we could just call it F default. Yeah, F default. Choose a good font. You should know that on Windows, I like the font Consolas. C O Consolas. On a Mac, I would recommend the font Menlo, e, uh, M E N L O. And here, I'm going to change the font size to 18, the style to bold. And you can come back here and change this later if you don't like it close out of that. Now in our checkpoint object, in a create event, write text fade equals zero, text fade max equals 90, buff equals five, comment buffer pixels on left and right of text for background rectangle. Text Y equals 50. We're going to place a text box 50 pixels above the checkpoint. And text equals open quotes, progress dot saved, open and close parentheses, semicolon. I'm just making it look like a function or code right here because that's kind of the cyberpunk vibe of our game. You could also just write checkpoint reached. You can write that close quote and then semicolon or progress, progress saved, exclamation point close quotes, semicolon. But uh, I'm going to keep with the vibe of the game. So cyberpunk, I'm going to make it look like code. Progress.saved, open and close parentheses, semicolon. Close quotes, semicolon. Now in the step event, add a new section that is going to check if the player is, in, is touching the checkpoint. And if it is touching the checkpoint, add alter some variables. So comment text. And write if place meeting x comma y comma o player close parentheses close parentheses open curly bracket close curly bracket text fade equals text fade max semicolon comment no fading text fade stays high then over here else open curly bracket close curly bracket 
indent text fade equals max zero text fade minus one close parenthesis semicolon comment reduce by one each frame until zero you know you could also just write instead of that you could also just write text fade uh right like if text fade is great greater than zero text fade minus minus semicolon that does the exact same thing but i kind of like this better it's a little bit more elegant and so if the uh, player object is touching the, the checkpoint object the text fade variable will continually set itself to be text fade max but if the player is not touching it it will reduce it by one until it reaches zero and now we're going to create a draw event draw draw so we'll first write draw self so it actually draws the sprite. And if you don't do that, it won't draw the sprite because whenever you write stuff in a draw event, it overwrites the assigned sprite. So we that's why we write draw self right at the very top. Draw set font f default. Draw set h align um, uh, center. Draw set v align. Uh, middle. This is all stuff I covered in my first tutorial series. Var text w half, little local variable here, equals string width of text divided by two plus r buff. Then var text h half equals string height of text. Divide that by two, and that's we don't need to add the buffer. So what this does, it checks how with our uh, with the font that we've chosen, how wide is our string that we wrote here in the create event in pixels. It divides that by two, so we can get like a middle point that we're going to use to uh, expand our background rectangle by our buffer to the right and our buffer to the left. And you're going to see that in a second. And then for our uh, string height, same thing with our assigned font. Uh, it checks how high that line of text is in pixels, and we divide it by two because we're going to make our rectangle that high, both top and bottom. If text fade is greater than zero, open curly brackets, close curly brackets, indent, draw set alpha, open parentheses, text fade divided by text fade Max, if you remember, draw set alpha from my first tutorial series goes from zero to one, so it acts like a percentage. So when we take text fade divided by text fade max, when text fade is 20 and text fade max is 20, which I think is what we set it to, text fade max 90, sorry, 90, 90, it'll be 100%, but when text fade is like 45 and text fade to max is 90, it will set the alpha or transparency to 50% and it'll keep reducing its transparency that way. Semicolon here. Draw set color, the aqua, draw rectangle, x minus text w half, comma, y minus text h half, uh, minus text y, comma. So this gives us our... Uh, the X location of our top left corner and the Y location of our top left corner. Let's see if man, I'm doing all this right. And then next is X plus text W half comma Y plus text H half minus text Y comma and then do we want this to be an outline rectangle? No, so we can write false or zero there. Close parentheses, semicolon. Whew, so that was kind of long, but this way, the top left corner is gonna, it's gonna look for the X position of our checkpoint object, and it's gonna move, uh, it's gonna create uh, the horizontal position of this rectangle, the top left corner to be uh, half the string length to the left. Then same here, it's gonna add half the string length to the right, and then for its height, it's going to have the same thing. Plus, we're adding this text Y to it, so it is above the checkpoint. And then at the very end here, because we're messing with draw set alpha, 
as you recall, at the end of a draw event, you should always write draw set alpha open parentheses one close parentheses semicolon to make everything else not fade. All right, let's run the game and see if it works. Let me make sure this caution disappears. It is not disappearing. Let's find text. Oh, I must have miswritten something. Oh, yeah, right here. Text underscore. There we go. I always look for those little cautions. Now it disappears. Now we can run the game and see if it works. When I touch a checkpoint, it is appearing. Oh, but I did not write our text. So we're seeing we're seeing the background rectangle fading appropriately, but we haven't added the text yet. So let's do that. So here, after it draws the rectangle, we need to draw our text. So draw set color the black and then draw text x comma y minus text y comma text so this is going to draw our text to be in the center of the the horizontal center of our checkpoint object it's going to be uh, the horizontal the vertical center of our checkpoint object minus text y which we set to 50 so it's going to be 50 pixels above it and then our string of text so now when we run the game it should work progress saved beautiful and it fades away progress saved and if we're over it it pops up and if we're not it disappears Now, in our level one, we're going to add a new instance layer right above our player layer. So let's click center fit because we're going to add a combat system. So right above our player layer, we're going to add a new instance layer. We're going to call it weapon. We're going to move it so it's just below checkpoints and above player there. And we're going to close that and we're going to create a new sprite. Sprites. And call uh, and we're going to call it S uh, weapon, I believe. Yes, S weapon. We're going to import our weapon sprites. These four images. Open. And we're going to set the FPS to twenty, and we're going to set the origin to be middle center. And we're going to add. An attack key. So open O player in the create event under player inputs, write the attack equals zero, and then create a new section called attack and write attack cooldown equals zero, attack max equals 20, semicolon, number of frames before we can attack again. And then in the step event, under player inputs, we will add the new input. Key attack equals keyboard check pressed VK space. So I'm going to make it the space bar. Minimize that, then create a new section after animations. Call it region attack and region. And write if attack cooldown is greater than zero, open curly brackets, close curly brackets, add a comment. If attack cooldown isn't zero, reduce it to zero. And in here, write attack cooldown equals max zero attack cooldown minus one. And here, write else, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, and new comment. If it is zero, then player can attack. Indent appropriately and write if he attack, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, attack cooldown equals attack max. Set the cooldown timer, and then instance create layer x 
Y is because we want the weapon to be at the exact same coordinates as our player object. In the weapon layer, create a weapon. Ah, but we haven't created a weapon yet, so we got to fix that. Go to objects, create object, O weapon, assign the appropriate sprite. There we go. So this should now appear. There we go. Instance create layer. What's our caution? O weapon. Oh, that's just because we created the object after after I run, run the game. That caution should disappear. So now when I hit space, it creates our weapon object. Now it isn't following us, it's not disappearing either. That's code we're gonna create in a moment, but it is creating our weapon, which is important. Ah, that'll disappear in a bit. Sometimes Game Maker has a hard time remembering to remove stuff. Actually, let me just rewrite this. It should. There we go. All right, now we're going to close, minimize that and close out of that. And we're going to go to O weapon and we're going to add a new event, but it's not going to be a regular step event. It's going to be the end step event, which means after all the other step events and the other objects have run, then this one will run. And we're going to write code that'll make the weapon follow the player. If instance exists, O player close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, x equals o player dot x, y equals o player dot y, semicolon, else, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, instance, destroy. So if our player object dies, because we're going to add like a death animation later, or if somehow our player object no longer exists, it will delete our weapon object. And let's run the game and see if it works. So when we create our weapon, it should now follow us around. Now we're only going to make it so the weapon appears briefly, but we need it to follow us around for a bit. So go to the create event of our O weapon object. And we're going to declare some variables to animate it slightly and to make it disappear after an amount of time. So write timer equals zero. Image index equals I random range zero. And you can either write three here because because we know that uh, there's four images that are labeled 0, 1, 2, and 3. You can also write uh, image number here in case uh, you change the number of sub images in that sprite. And I'm going to click with my scroll wheel to open up the help manual. And it says the number of sub images. Uh, but note that uh, if the please note that there is, for example, one sub image, the variable will return one, but the sub the image index for that sub image is zero. So just to be careful, we would have to actually write image number minus one. So this way, if you add more sub images to that weapon, this will be appropriate. Uh, for now, let's just put three, and you've got to remember in the future if you change the weapon animation to like something that is like seven sub images, that you need to create a uh, change this valuable to be like six, zero to six. That doesn't make sense, it's okay, you'll figure it out. And then flipped equals I random range one to two. And then if flipped double equal sign two, image X scale equals negative one. So this makes it that if, it, if flipped is one, it'll just be the regular horizontal orientation, but if it returns two, it'll be flipped. It just makes it more random, glitchy looking, which is kind of cool. And then add a regular step event and write if timer is greater than zero, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, timer minus minus, else open curly bracket, close curly bracket, instance destroy. So this will destroy our weapon after a set amount of time, and that set amount of time is, oh sorry, it's not supposed to be zero, it's supposed to be eight, or eight frames. There we go. My notes, it was looking a little small. Let me zoom in on my notes a little bit so I can actually read them. Now run it so when we create our weapon, it should exist for exactly eight frames, and it should be flipping sometimes. It looks nice and glitchy. Good, good, good. Finally, in the O enemy, 
snap event. Make it so if it touches the weapon, it gets destroyed. So let's go to the bottom here. Go down a few lines and write a comment. Defeat if place meeting X, Y, O, weapon. Uh, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. Instance, destroy, open and close parentheses, semicolon. Now we can test it out. So we can try to create our weapon and touch our enemy with it. Oh. There we go. I was hitting the wrong, wrong key for our weapon. There we go. So if we hit our weapon key and touch an enemy with it, it makes the enemy destroy, destroy itself. Let's give the enemies a little explosion animation to accompany their deaths. Let's close out of this and create a new sprite and call it S explode. Let's import the appropriate images, which should be here, S explode zero zero, and all the way, go all the way up to eight. So there should be nine images total. And set the S FPS to 30. Set the origin to be middle center because we want it the same as our enemy sprite. And then create a new object, call it O explode, set the appropriate sprite, and then in O explode, go down to other, and then find animation end, which means after it reaches the end of its sub images in its animation, you'll write instance destroy. Now in O enemy, in the defeat section, I'll add this above the instance destroy code, write instance create layer X, Y, we're gonna create a uh, write bad, and then O explode. Except I don't think we've created a bad layer yet, so we need to do that. There we go. So what this will do is it'll create our explosion object and then get rid of the enemy object and then we'll see the explosion animation play out before the explosion gets rid of itself. But we need to go to our level one. Oh, we do have a bad layer. That's good. And that's where we have our enemies. Fantastic. That means we can test it. So when I touch it, you should see a little, little explosion. Yep, a little boo. All right, so there's different ways to play around with this combat system. You can add like a stamina bar system. I've done that in my game called Fetch Quest. So you can create a little stamina system so that you can uh, attack repeatedly until you run out of stamina and the stamina bar recharges. You can change the, the weapon to be a sword where the weapon object appears in front of the player object always, even when you're uh, changing different directions. You can expand and play around this. Uh, you'll just have to learn that by yourself. So there's a lot of flexibility here, but this is the very most basic version of a weapon system and a combat system and a checkpoint system for a platformer. platformer. So that's it for this video. In the next video, we're going to learn about room transitions, fade in and fade out transitions between different levels. We're going to add a game camera and screen shake, and our rooms will therefore can be much bigger and the camera the game camera will follow the character around the level and the screen shake will be a really cool effect to add. So I will see you there.